Hi, and welcome to STEAM Preschool Activities for STEM Enrichment. I'm Jamie, and with me is Amanda from the Educator Spin On It. And tonight we are talking about preschool art, which happens to be one of my favorite subjects as I am certified and have been an art instructor. And I taught from preschool all the way through high school. And I started to add up the number of students I've had over the years, and I'm well over 10,000 students that I have actually taught. And so I'm like, all right, bringing some experience then to our early learners and what preschool art looks like. And I'm going to go ahead and tonight share some uh, our activity from our ebook. But before we get into all that, let me go ahead and Amanda, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks, Jamie. Uh, I have not had quite as many children in my classroom, uh, but I do have experience teaching kindergarten and first grade. I'm national board certified in early childhood along with my K-12 reading masters. I also am a parent to three children. One is a four-year-old preschooler. So um, I have a lot of experience using art in the mainstream curriculum areas. And I think that art is one of the most underutilized tool in today's classrooms uh, because it seems to reach children of a lot of different learning styles. Um, and as a teacher, I tried to incorporate art into almost every day and as many possible learning activities that I could. And now as a parent, I am trying to make sure that my preschooler has an art enrichment and access to art materials at least once, if not two or three times during the day. So Jamie is kind of my go-to uh, person that I like to visit her blog, uh, Hammy Kids Art, for some new ideas. And she always gets my mind spinning on ways that I can get my kids exploring and learning maybe a little bit more um, of the art and crafty, or the, not the crafty, but the more creative aspect and technique wise versus the crafty, you have to look like my project at the end. So um, Jamie, I know we were talking a little bit before we went on air about tools that we have in our, in our preschool art cabinet. Um, what do you recommend for parents and teachers to have on the back? Yeah, and this is an excellent question, and I get asked this all the time. Um, I'll even have friends call me and say, I'm at the art store right now. What do I need to get for your project, like the project you did last week on your site? You <laughs> so, are such a good friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, I get this question, and even when I was teaching in the classroom, I would get parents that would come by and ask, you know, what are things we can do at home? And for the preschool level, I have some favorite things. I'm going to start off with my most favorite one. This is um, it's called a couple different things, paint marker or paint dauber. But you simply turn it upside down. You press down these. And what I love about this is the preschooler can stamp it and create circles and create patterns or they can actually squeeze and draw with it as well. Um, both of my kids... My, dot markers. Yeah, this is... Um, the brand name is Do A Dot. But you can also find a similar item at the dollar store and they're the bingo um, daubers. So a lot of people may see them for bingo cards. It's the same principle and uh, they work really well with preschool and you know it even helps with their fine motor as they're stamping along. So mine this I think were like sixteen dollars for the pack. Mm -hmm. So mine were really expensive because I got the nicer ones. But um, they lasted four years. Yes. I think so my pack was only about eight dollars, I think. Um, but and they come in all different colors. You can even get sparkly which when I had them in the classroom, that was like a big treat, was we got out the sparkly paint, sparkly paint.
paint markers. So that was always a fun day. <laughs> but the students really love them. I know my own preschoolers really love them, and it's a great, it's a great introduction to kind of paint and how to work with paint as well. Do you want me to keep going, or did you want to? Uh, no, go in. Um, I just know too that there's a whole bunch of, um, like if you're on Pinterest, you can even look up dot marker activities. And oh, there's, there's so much. There's like, some printable sheets, and yes, there's a lot you can do with them um, rather than just paint. But if I need, you know, extra ten minutes while cooking dinner, I will just set out white paper and these yes. markers. <laughs> And I know, because they know how to use them, and it's something they can use that I don't have to stand right there, because uh, they know you don't, you know, paint the wall with them, or they know it goes on the paper. So it's a perfect activity for when I need a few minutes, and they're just painting by themselves. Whereas if I have a lot of paint out, maybe I'm more right next to them as we're doing that. And um, I use them with my toddler too, although they do stain, they're not washable. Um, so he ends up stacking the caps um, because even the, st the caps stack. So I, I'm, I'm with you. Those are a favorite in our house too. Yeah. Well, and then you bring up a great way into my next favorite. And by the way, I'm not sponsored by Crayola or any of these brands. However, if they would like to sponsor me, you know, contact me, but <laughs> um, is the washable finger paint. Now, a lot of people use tempera paint, which you can, and in the classroom, I use tempera. I see Amanda's also holding it up, but I love the finger paint because it washes up so easily. It washes out of clothing. It washes off the wall. It washes off the table. It works really well. Did you want to add to that, Amanda? <laughs> um, can I just say I'm not, I'm not uh, an art snob or anything, but I do only buy Crayola paints, just because I have had the best experience with them um, in the fact that they do wash if they say washable, and for the fact that um, they just tend to last and they tend to paint better. So. I'm not sponsored either, but as a classroom teacher, I always encourage my parents to buy name brand or nicer things because a lot of times they'll last longer. They may cost more a little bit in the beginning, but... That is an excellent point. I would totally agree. The Crayola does last, and actually even with my next one, um, talking about watercolors, the praying watercolors also my favorite. I always made sure I had these in the classroom and I buy the same kind for my own kids and they last a really long time and that is the biggest difference. If you just get paint from say the dollar store for example, uh, it's not going to last as long. <laughs> Your colors aren't going to be as bright but you can tell we didn't even plan this and we have the same materials. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was just going to say. But um, this one is not a name brand, and like if you can tell, um, this was after only like three times when my kids painted, and the colors have been used up. So sometimes it makes more sense, especially like I know preschoolers. Um, I actually have a, I'm an eight-year-old, and so I and a toddler. So we have three sets of these. Uh, and that way, we always give the toddler his own because he likes to mix them all. And uh, nobody else wants them mixed. I always say mix on the paper, don't mix here. However, one-year-olds don't have a tendency to like that. It just ends up a black mess. So he gets his own. And uh, we were gifted with some, I think they were just from the dollar store. And literally after the th third time, they're already empty. Whereas Prang or Crayola, there's a couple other nicer brands out there. I've used them teaching kindergarten with 26 kids, painting every single Friday, and they've lasted me like four years of a school year. Yes, I completely agree. So there are certain things it's worth paying a little more upfront, but it's because it'll last you a lot longer. And since we're talking about the paint, and you talked about your toddler and um, mixing colors, 
you'll notice I do have two missing here. <laughs> I take out the brown and black. And that way, because for some reason, children just really are drawn to the brown and black. And that's the first one they go to. And then if they go to all the other colors, you know, everything turns brown or black. So sometimes, not all the time, I will just go ahead and take those colors out. And then that way, if they want to make brown or black, they have to make their own. But which is usually by mixing all the colors together, they find. <laughs> they, they still find a way, but it's a lot harder for them to do. They do. Well, and I think that's a difference, too, is that some of the different brands won't pop out. And um, in the classroom, I did that a lot, where if, if we were just doing an activity with warm colors, I actually would sit and pop them all out, and I'd only put warm colors and so that way it kind of limited the, the palette and required them to use creativity within what they had. And that's one of my tips for painting with young painters is only set out two or three colors. Sometimes they get overwhelmed when they have so many colors to choose from. So sometimes by limiting the colors, it actually helps them focus and explore more of the material. Okay, I want to see what your next one is and see if I have it in my box right now. Okay, well, this is the last one I'll share so that we can get to our activity tonight. But the last one, and this is one people are not as familiar with. Wait, let me turn so the label is facing. Um, liquid watercolors. Ooh. Now, I know I just showed, you know, the regular watercolors that we all grew up with. But this is something that's a little more new. And I love it because this huge bottle will last forever. You simply just, we use little bathroom cups. I just pour a couple, few drops in, mix it with water, and then this will last, you know, a couple different projects. And so you dilute it with water and it, it lasts for so long. So once again, you may pay a little more upfront, but it lasts forever. And the colors are really bright. That's what I love, is they get a nice, really bright color, and it really kind of pops the artwork. So when I was in the classroom, we used a lot more liquid watercolors than we actually did the regular. But I still wanted them you know, to learn how to mix with the water and everything. So we, so we did both. But the liquid is really nice. And um, it's just so fun to get that bright color with the paint. So, okay, is that what you were going to share? No. <laughs> I, my other paint that I actually use is that um, my kids like the tempera. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a tendency to go through it. This is what I think you need to know about me. What, the paintbrushes? Yes. <laughs> Um, I only have three children, but I have at least 50 paintbrushes. Oh, Amanda, that's nothing. You should see. I can't even bring in <laughs> my basket of paintbrushes. Well, you know, here's the deal. It's that you have to have a variety of shapes and size and colors and traditional and non-traditional things for children to explore with paint. And so this is my paintbrush stash. And I was going to think about like making it a little smaller, and I just can't part with it. No, don't make it smaller. I love it. I, love <laughs> I figured I, give I could variety. show an art teacher. Yes, give a variety. Let them choose. And I love the non-traditional. Preschooler, well, all artists love working with, like I saw a toothbrush in there. We we put our old toothbrushes right in the paint um, paint jar too. So those non traditional things it really just helps them think you know what other things can make a mark or make a tool or be a tool. Yes, and we use things like combs and crazy kitchen items. But um, my other absolute must with preschoolers and painting um, or really any art with that requires a paintbrush is these wonderful cups. Um, I've had them forever. I know they're still on the market because I've seen them. But you fill it up with water and then you cover it and then they put the paintbrush right inside so that they rinse their brush off this way. And it 
cuts down on a lot of water spills. At least in our house it does. So I got these and I've been very thankful for them ever since because we used to have a lot of spilling. I don't know. Have you used those? I have. I used to use them with my kindergartners. So we would uh, paint with those. And it does. It works really well. Uh, the other thing I used to mix paint in that worked wonders were egg cartons. Um, where I just fill a couple things with just two or three colors, put a, a couple of just water too, and because it's low to the table, it doesn't spill as easily. That's a good idea. It's shallow. Yes, that's the word. Shallow. <laughs> low to the table, shallow. Yes. So I'm with you. <laughs> it's when you're using, you know, kind of like a big bucket. That's definitely. Uh, when those spills happen. And they do happen, but if you um, have a drop cloth down and some simple ones are just like a plastic tablecloth or an old shower curtain, uh, those wipe up very easily and you can reuse them. Uh, that's what we tend to use. Rather than, newspaper will also work, but if you have a big water spill then you have to, you know, can't really reuse that newspaper. But just a cheap Tablecloth or shower curtain does work. Do you use anything for a drop cloth, Amanda? Uh, you know, if you actually, I'm trying to, like when I show an activity, I'm trying to show how I set it up with my kids because, um, you know, I do write quite often about doing educational activities, not always art, uh, because, you know, art does encompass a lot of them just because it's so awesome uh, and beneficial to kids, but, um, when you have a one-year-old, a four-year-old, and an eight-year-old all trying to do the same project with different adaptations, um, I think that sometimes it's hard to say, like, how do I set this up? Um, so, like, if you go on the educator spin on it this week, uh, we have an owl painting, which I'm really trying to. I'm trying Ooh, to I do love it. Yeah. So this is what he did. He's four. And, um, but I did it with all three of my kids, and so we literally just set, uh, we went outside. <laughs> because well, And that's another way to do it, is just go outside. We um, set newspaper out. Yes. So if you look at like the first picture of, oh, this is how you set it up. Um, everything is nice and tidy, nothing is like messy. Well then, as you follow along on our process, by the end you're going to see the paint water has spilled over, so the newspaper's wet. Um, I didn't get a picture, but we were using the toothbrush, like splatter painting the stars. And so my four-year-old is sitting doing this right in front of him, and his eight-year-old sister is right next to him. And so if you can imagine what happened to her hair. <laughs> so, she goes, I have yellow stars all over my hair, Mom. And I'm like, oh, just go take a shower. Um, so a lot of times, if I know ahead of time it's going to be a really messy, like, splatter painting or something that maybe they're not familiar with, I will definitely send them outside or make sure that they change into clothes that I don't, doesn't matter. Because my children have a tendency to um, full body experience art. Well, that's the best way to do it. Yeah, like you say dot markers, and I'm like recalling the last time we used dot markers, and my son dot markered his face. I'm like, oh my god. So and that will happen. Well, my it's kids part of learning. He has to feel it, and then he wants to see the reaction, and I'm like, well. You used a different material, huh? Like, this one's just going to have to wash off. So I try not to make it a big deal and then just remind them of the rules the next time. So, yeah, we and try to take it outside. That's what, I, you know, I do with my three year old, too. You know, it's about their learning. I think that's one thing we have to keep in mind is they're learning and we have to you know, teach them how to use the tool. It may seem kind of second nature, just kind of pick up the paintbrush and start mixing the water and the color. But if you actually take the time, show them, you know, here's how we take the brush, you dip it in the water, swirl it around, then, you know, taking that extra minute to help show them and model, 
that will help them, you know, learn those boundaries and rules and not get dot faced <laughs> like all over. I can just imagine because I've seen it before in the classroom. <laughs> Jamie, it's every day. <laughs> I, I send my mom um, art pictures, and she literally um, has been printing them, and she has a little, my preschooler's art wall, of his body paintings. He just, he he's one of those kids that just, he, it doesn't matter what art medium it is, he's got to experience it to the fullest. Well, so, that goes to knowing your child too, you know, like we've talked about in some of our previous hangouts, is knowing your child, how they learn and want to experience is going to help you guide the activity. Mm -hmm. So when you set out a new material, you may know that you have to do that. <laughs> oh yeah, for us it's a must. And then I have friends that come over and their preschoolers are like meticulously drawing like the most perfect circles and then painting inside that circle. And so you're right, it, it's all about knowing your kid and trying different ways to reach them, which is why we use art. Exactly. And that, you know, the way I've been able, because, you know, I said in the beginning I've taught, you know, so many students, and I would see a thousand students a week come in and out of my room. Wow. And so that's a lot of, you know, students in a short amount of time. and. It's, you know, having those procedures in place is how we, you know, got through and learned the materials. But it's, you know, getting to know those children and how they learned. I, over time, then, I could adapt the activities and kind of, I even had different centers set up. So, you know, we'd have the same project, but students, one may want to solve it three-dimensionally, where one student may want to solve it by painting and one student may want to solve it by drawing. So it's, you know, but to even get to that point, and I think this is where we are in the preschool level, is just you have to experience it first. So you have to experience it and learn. So let's go ahead and jump into our activity then. So we're, um, our art challenge was to build a habitat for a bug. And what I love, I always love including nature because it's such a great source of inspiration and so beautiful. And I, I don't know about you, Amanda, but we did go outside. And while it's not quite fall colors where we live, we did look around and we talked about, though, what kind of uh, colors we do see, what happens to the trees as we kind of just walked around the block. And while we were doing this, then we were also looking for sticks to include into our project. Did you happen to uh, discuss about fall or go outside, Amanda? Uh, we did the whole project outside. <laughs> I just yeah, I just put my paint and my glue in the little bucket with the paper, and we headed straight outside. And um, the kids definitely, I think that for us, this challenge was a win-win on lots of different levels because it got the kids moving. Uh, and I think so many times we forget that these are little guys and girls and they need to move because a lot of times movement is the way they learn. Um, so we were moving. We were outside getting fresh air. We were, like you said, talking about the environment. Um, my kids actually found the acorns and so we were discussing how come the acorns were green <laughs> and not brown and um, the ones that they found, and which trees in our backyard were the oak trees. And how long, we, they, they wanted to know how long it takes for the oak tree to grow. And then they were really disappointed when I told them they had to pick a little branch for their bug habitat. And we were trying to talk about how it was a symbol of a tree and not really the actual tree. <laughs> so that was kind of how our conversation went. but. Um, it got the kids outside, got them talking about science, and yet still let them um, explore creativity. And we were talking more about colors of fall and um, sunset. Yeah, and that's where I do have mine here. And I'll carefully hold it up because our, our spider is a little fragile. But uh, we talked about the colors, too. And so we use the warm colors to represent the leaves. And then so here's our stick. And it was hard to choose just one. They they definitely wanted to incorporate more. But, you know, we just put 
put one on the on the plate, and we um, just simply use tape to tape the leaves on and tape is a good thing for preschoolers too because tearing it off it uh, helps get those fine motor skills so that's why I do you know like for sometimes just to use the tape rather than glue everything all the time and it just so happened that this same week we were doing this uh, my son was talking about spiders in school so that was on his mind and he was just like I'm making a spider that's what I'm doing so, and that's where a lot of times, you know, you want to get your child engaged. So if, if they want to make something other than the bug, you know, I would just go with it. I would just let them, okay, let's see, how can we make that? What type of habitat would that animal or creature have? So I wouldn't, you know, try to force the bug thing, but I thought it was funny. So we made the tree, we got the leaves, we made the spider, and then my son goes, oh, but he needs a web. And, you know, that's where he's going to sit on. So then at the last, at the end of the project, then I got out some white yarn and he wove it around to create the web, which I thought was smart thinking for, you know, uh, coming up with the spider. So, Amanda, what bug did you guys choose? Well, we have been on a ladybug kick. So the kids were talking about how when it gets cold, the ladybugs ha find a warm place to hide. Um, and what's great is that if you go on the educator spin on it, you can kind of see my kids' version of the same activity and how totally different but yet still similar they are. Um, I let them just glue leaves that they found. Um, so it's kind of all natural and then my son wanted to put some dirt on the ground so we have a lot of glue and a lot of dirt. Um, at one point I did say I think we might have to shake some of it off. <laughs> the dirt and the glue and the leaves. Um, but they definitely were having fun and talking about well you know you can't just have a branch because there has to be a place for the roots to get nutrients from the soil and I was like oh my goodness guys you're really thinking about this science this art um, and trying to represent it with different mediums so I could definitely say ours is a mixed medium and then um, I had thought I had some air baked clay and then I couldn't find it so I kind of when I do art projects and I think I have an idea of what I want my kids to do in my head and then I look in my cupboard and I don't see the materials for that idea. Um, instead of going to the store I try to think what could I adapt and um, we found some of the old, it's old because it was still cracking, uh, regular clay and so um, of course my kids had mixed all the colors together so I just had them pick out as much of the red as they could and then they made ladybugs so they'll never harden but in the whole scheme of things that's totally fine because they still had experience with another art medium the clay and they were working with their fine motors and they both created these I don't know if you can see them yes love it they were so cute because they were outside and I you know gave them this huge chunk of clay and they quick found all the greens and yellows and took that out and found the red and then they made a sphere and pressed it down and then my eight-year-old was like well it doesn't really look like a ladybug it needs a head so then they actually used the acorn I love then, that creative thinking and problem solving awesome and then then they're like well let's make the dots and so they were sticking the sticks to make the holes for the dots but they said it didn't look enough like a ladybug so they actually it's like I don't know if you can really tell but it's a stick so they broke little pieces of stick and then pushed them in and then used little kind of twigs for legs and um, then they both put them underneath like they had a branch straight up and down and then they had a little twig laying on the ground and they both said that their ladybug needs to go under the twig so it will be warm for the winter. So I thought that was kind of cute of them. 
Yeah, no, and I think you bring up an excellent point. You know, even though we both had the same activity, completely different ways you can do it. And I think that's where, as we talked about, knowing your child, what's going to engage them, and that creative thinking. Like, I love, let's use the acorn for the head and, you know, sticks to represent the dots. That's awesome. So as a parent and you're, you know, guiding the activity, I would suggest use those open-ended questions to kind of get them to think about those details mm -hmm. and those things. Because a preschooler may just kind of be like, okay, well, here, here it is. So then you want to encourage and kind of stretch out that knowledge and, you know, refer back to, okay, so where does this bug live? Or like you guys talked about, where does it go when it gets colder out? You know, those, so those are all things you can keep to keep asking to get that conversation going. And what I really wished I had was some actual nonfiction books on ladybugs, because um, then it would have been nice to just come inside and sit and read them. So that's on my list to reserve at the library. No, and that's a great idea too to extend. It's great because then they'll have the experience of making it. And then you have the experience of reading, and I, that's brilliant. I think I'll have to go check out some spider books, too. <laughs> um, there's, the spider books are awesome. I have, yeah. like, eight spider books, but no ladybugs. Like, really? <laughs> yeah, well, that's funny. I think we have a couple ladybugs and no spider bugs, so. Yeah, it's much closer, you know. <laughs> so um, I did want to say one thing. I know that... Um, in my mom's groups that like we get together for play groups, I've had some parents say, well, I'm just not really crafty. Um, and I have to admit, I am more of a crafty mom. Um, like I enjoy doing it and I kind of, as a teacher, see the value in it. But how do you, I don't know, if you're not a crafty person, how can you rationalize doing these projects? That's an excellent question. And because I am, I admit, I'm a crafty person. I love it, I, you know. And you can certainly check out my blog to be inspired. Hey, I make kids art. But here's my answer is art helps and helps get that creative thinking. It helps you learn how to think outside of the box and realize that problems can have more than one solution. And I really feel it is a critical skill for students to learn, even at the young age of a preschooler, that they can start thinking kind of beyond and realize, I'm kind of going abstract here, but just realize that there are multiple ways to solve a problem. And so, you know, as we talked about how I did the activity versus how Amanda did it with her kids, you know, those are two pretty different ways, and it was still the same design activity. So I always, to um, all of the students I had, I would always try to communicate to the parents that it is important to help develop crit critical thinking creative thinking, kind of, I use those interchangeably as kind of the same thing, but it's learning how to think. And that's where I think art kind of makes you step out of your comfort zone and makes you explore new things. And I totally get, I have a lot of friends who are not crafty at all. And so that's why they some will call me and, you know, at the store, like I said. But and I, I don't know how else to put it other than I just really think it's a strong skill that um, students need to have in order to be successful later in life. And a lot of times, in especially our education system today, which I won't go on and on about, but, uh, you know, art is being cut out of a lot of schools, um, art, music, uh, drama, and unfortunately, and I saw this with my own eyes in the years I was teaching from when I first started to when I, you know, left the classroom, is that the creative thinking was not as strong. Um, a lot of students wanted to be told how to do a project, 
where I, that was not my teaching style. I kind of did it like how we did this activity. Here's a challenge, here's a problem, how can we solve it and create a solution? And so I think it's using that type of thinking to help your student succeed and be a lifelong learner and be successful later in life. Okay, I'll, stop. I'll end it there. <laughs> oh, no. I'm like, we could probably do like five whole hangouts on this. But, oh, um, I know. I could go on and on about creative thinking and why it's oh. important. But I, <laughs> and that's where I think sometimes, well, they're like, they're in preschool, you know, but what you're doing in preschool is you're setting those experiences. Uh, those first experiences so that they have some knowledge and gain experience in how things work, how tools work, how they can make a mark, and how they can express themselves. And um, it kind of brings me back to um, when I was getting my reading masters um, and we were studying books and a lot of it is that you know it was all women in my class and they were talking about that when you are reading there might be a child in your class that doesn't like what you're reading so if you keep reading just that style you're never going to reach that child and i think oftentimes as parents this kind of applies to everything like yes there are kids but their learning styles may be totally different their interests may be totally different the way they connect with the world and make decisions and problem solve could be totally different than the way we do. And so even if you're not a crafty person, it's still important to challenge yourself to make a point to have those opportunities available for your children. Now, you may not do it every single day if it's like not your favorite thing to do or not saying do it all day long. Just saying make a point to say, okay, what could I do to explore creatively art, maybe sciences like we're doing, or math in a way. And if you check out our book, STEAM, Preschool Activities for STEM Enrichment, we will give you uh, even more simple activities that you can do for art to help connect it with some other STEM um, academic areas. Well, that's exactly it. And you bring up an excellent point that, you know, the whole point of STEAM is it's not just art as a separate little category itself. You can connect it. Like here we're connecting to science and you can next week, you know, we're connecting with math and it's incorporating art with a, a kind of everything. And that as an art teacher, I used to get sometimes frustrated because Everything I did did connect to the you know curriculum and to what the students were learning and so it would go along. Because if I brought in something completely new, it wasn't gonna, you know, go with necessarily their prior knowledge. So I would collaborate with the teachers and you know follow up on that. Now I know not not every you know teacher does that, but that's how I did it so that they could have those experiences because to me it's just art just goes with it. It just helps engage the student, maybe hook them in, and help them find a way that they can express their solution to the problem. And another suggestion I have, if you're not crafty at all, then look in your local community, see if there um, is either classes, or if you have a friend that's crafty, maybe you could say, hey, can we come to your house and do an activity? And then you guys can come over here and we'll do, you know, just a science or reading or something else. So I would suggest, you know, finding a way, whether it's partnering with a friend or finding a, uh, just a class in your community of giving your child that experience. Because I feel it's important. Well, and Jamie, don't you have um, like a little art? Art. I do. I, I do on Hamney Kids Art. Thank you, Amanda. Well, um, I was going to say, like, I really want to do it. <laughs> I do have an online art camp where it is, you know, me giving instructional videos. I also have a YouTube channel that you can check out that has instructional videos on how to do artwork as well. And I like to to always keep in mind, I like to say for the busy parent, because I know we're all busy. I know we all don't have as many paintbrushes as Amanda and I have. So 
<laughs> so I could try to keep it real, realistic. It's got problems. <laughs> yeah. um, but just like our our ebook, the theme, you know, we do have a whole chapter on art that relates to the different curriculums, and it includes basic materials. So you don't need fancy equipment or fancy tools, and you don't need. Our whole goal behind it is to make it less stress for you and easy to implement at home with your preschooler. Anything you want to add to that, Amanda? No, I think that totally hits it on the spot. Um, so we have done science, technology, engineering, and art. So we've had four weeks of challenges already. And uh, both Jamie and I post it on our blog on Fridays and have announced kind of the directions for the activity and then we show you pictures from our experience with our preschoolers and how that went. And we encourage you to do the same. Uh, you're welcome to check in with us and let us know that you've done it by leaving a comment. Um, and then also, if you're just seeing this video today, you can go back and do those activities. They're not time sensitive. Um, you can do one every day this week for a whole fun STEAM week and then <laughs> buy, buy our ebook and then you have four more weeks planned. Uh, so like Jamie said earlier, we're here because we're parents and we have classroom experience and what we want to do is share what's worked and I guess the easiest way possible for you to just pick up directions and do it with your kids. So we're saving you time and um, hopefully you won't have to search around the internet to find, um, oh I want to find five science activities. We've already got them for you and the really easy directions to follow um, and people seem to find it very helpful in their classroom and home environment. Awesome. And so next week is math. We hope you'll join us again. And thank you for checking out. We'll put our link to the ebook below so that you can go ahead and purchase your copy. All right. Thank you.